Welcome to Murder in the Air Mystery Theater. I'm your host, Lori Fagan. In this podcast series, I'll interview authors who will then read their mystery, suspense, or thriller short stories or a chapter from their published books. In addition, sprinkled throughout the coming weeks, the podcast will feature radio theater style sections from the audiobooks for my three crime fiction novels. On this episode, we're going to have some fun with some short, short stories. I'm going to read some of my fiction stories, and three of them are 200 to 250 words only, but they still have a mystery or a crime. Now, I had been reading the Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine of short mystery stories for years, but I thought after writing broadcast news and nonfiction for my career, I couldn't possibly write fiction. But in the back of the magazine is the Mysterious Photograph Contest, which is simply a photo and a headline requesting submissions of no more than 250 words, and it must contain a crime. So I decided to try my hand at it. I submitted Frozen Assets and was chosen as one of the runners-up. This became the impetus for me getting into crime fiction mystery writing in the first place. Frozen Assets by Lori Fagan. So, when did you realize the money was missing? Joe Harrington, a seasoned detective, took notes on a small pad of paper as bank manager Jerry Thompson wrung his hands nervously. Harrington walked around the vault. Well, it was first thing this morning when my manager, Sue Jones, opened the bank, Thompson replied. And just who had access to this vault? There are only a couple of people who have keys and combinations, and I trust them. Need names and contact info ASAP, Harrington interrupted as he walked out of the room. He peered into a wastebasket just outside the door and stopped, fishing out a crumpled white sack with his pen. Which one's the fast food junkie? I wouldn't have the slightest, answered a surprised Thompson. But I believe a teller, Tony Stewart, works part-time at the chicken shack, but he does not have access to this floor, detective. Harrington pushed his way toward the back of the chicken shack. Hey, you can't go back there, an employee said. Anybody seen Tony Stewart today? Harrington asked. No, and he missed his shift last night, the manager said. I'm going to fire his ass when I see him. The detective opened the walk-in freezer door and paused. I'd say his ass is frozen, along with the assets, he declared, looking at a very blue Stuart along with Jones, both dead on the floor, surrounded by stacks of currency. Here's another short, short story called Rocks, Hard Places. Don't leave me here. Tom said, his bleeding leg stuck at an odd angle between two large boulders. It was late afternoon, and their superstition mountain desert hike had gone awry. I have to go for help, Susan said, exasperated. My cell phone is dead. It's a half hour to the car and another hour to the house. She paused. Of course, it'll be just another half hour to stop in Scottsdale and pick up those Jimmy Chews I've had my eyes on, she continued. By then, it'll be dark and... What? Wait, you mean... Are you saying when you slipped and knocked me down here, you 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 did that on purpose? Asked Tom in disbelief. Let's face it, Tom. You're literally between a rock and a hard place. I've tried to tell you many times that we're over, but you just don't listen. You bit, Tom started angrily. Seriously? One more time. I really hate hiking. And for the very last time, you're not going to smack me around anymore, Tom. Susan calmly started to walk away. No, Tom screamed. Susan turned around and looked at him coolly. Night, night. Don't let the scary desert critters bite. This next story was an entry to the Golden Donut Short Story Contest sponsored by the Writers Police Academy, 
which I attended and thoroughly enjoyed a couple of times. This story was based on a black and white photo of four cheap bunk beds, two on the left and two on the right, and in the center, an old crooked metal desk and chair. On the flat surface of the desk sat an old royal typewriter. The short story was to be exactly 200 words. Here's my submission. Violated by Lori Fagan. I knew something was wrong the minute I opened the door. Fortunately, my beloved garage sale royal manual with the missing L key was still sitting on the metal shelf where I had left it earlier. All four beds were made and empty, which meant my three roomies were out. Then I saw it. The metal vault door was ajar. It was an odd place for a safe. With a depth of only two inches, I often wondered what on earth it was supposed to hold. Too small for cash, unless the bills sat upright. Too cramped for a weapon, unless it hung on a non-existent hook. Too skinny for a manuscript, which would flop out when opened. So I used it for the only thing I could, something so personal I kept the safe locked. But I had the only key, and it was in my pocket. And now the door was open. Don't touch it. Maybe they can get fingerprints. Wait, my prints are already on it, and they'll rule them out. I carefully opened the door with my pen. Aghast, over my inspirational note, Believe in Yourself, someone had scribbled, Quit piddling, just write. Here's a short story written during and following a recent short story boot camp offered by Sisters in Crime Desert Sleuths. It takes place on the beautiful Caribbean island of St. Lucia, which became independent within the British Commonwealth in 1979. I've spent time there, and it was a lovely, relaxing trip. This short crime fiction story is called Murder on St. Lucia. The beautiful island of St. Lucia held the mysterious and dark smell of death. It was supposed to be a relaxing, fun-filled getaway on Sandy Beach on the south side of the island near the airport. Ted's anticipation of the trip was like an anxious child fidgeted on the stairs at 4 a.m. on Christmas morning. He was to meet his globe-trotting wife, Elizabeth, after she finished training a group of high-level execs in London on the new technology of sharing computer screens, webinars, and live computer chats. It wasn't even a surprise when Elizabeth didn't arrive as expected. He just figured she got held up and would catch the next flight. In his mind's eye, he could see her finally flopping on the cushiony sofa in their suite, exclaiming, Where's my daiquiri? But it wasn't until the second day when there was no text nor voice message and his calls went directly to voicemail that his heart picked up an unnatural speed and his hands would not dry no matter how many times he wiped them on his floral swim jams. Are you sure there's been no calls or messages for me? He asked the front desk clerk for the fifth time that morning. Hearing yet another negative response, he decided it might be time to take the dreaded next action of calling in local law enforcement. The police officer from the city of St. Lucia sat with a mild, quizzical expression on his face as Ted paced back and forth in the blue and white hotel room, sun streaming in through the open patio doors. Detective Jean Artista, as he introduced himself, had the eternal tan of an island-born native, with dark wavy hair shining with a pomade of some kind. The 80-degree-plus temperatures called for neat, knee-length shorts, short sleeve shirts, and a long-billed hat for the police force on the normally peaceful and calm island of love. Is there a chance you might have missed your wife's call? Artista's pen sat poised over a small pad of paper. Sometimes the internet service is not so good here. No, I can't imagine how I would. I've checked emails, texts, voicemail, even called our next-door neighbor who's watching our place, 
to see if she had heard anything from her. Nothing. It's impossible, unless... Unless what, monsieur? The unthinkable happened. Somehow, something terrible has happened to her. But it is clear from the video airport authorities provided that she landed at the St. Lucia airport as scheduled. The detective's tone was clearly accusatory and condescending at the same time. Then something or someone intercepted her and kidnapped her or something. But why? The officer put his pen on the table. How is your marriage, monsieur? Were you and your wife having uh, problems? What? No, I love my wife. I just don't understand why she's not here with me. The officer stood, putting on his hat. My apologies, sir, but you may want to consider that perhaps she does not wish to be here with you. We will keep you apprised if anything changes. Let us know if you hear from your wife. It was two more agonizing days of waiting, hoping, even praying, something Ted hadn't done in years, when he got a knock on his hotel door. The St. Lucia police detective stood, turning his hat around and around in his hands. We have some news, he said quietly. What? Tell me, have you found her? Ted hadn't bothered to shave, so a scraggly stubble covered his face, his eyes dark from lack of sleep. Yes, we have. I would like you to come to police headquarters with me. Wait, is she okay? No, sir. I am very sorry to say she is not. She is dead. Ted took a step back, grabbing the door frame to hold himself up. No. What? How? Please, come with me and your questions will be answered. Ted sat at the plain metal table, his head shaking back and forth in his hands. Oh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, he sobbed. This video was not discovered until after we last spoke, a somber detective Artista said. Your wife got into the taxi cab of an independent driver who is now in custody. We found her body at... No, I don't want to hear. My poor Elizabeth. Ted's face was glistening with tears. I am very sorry, monsieur. We will make arrangements to have her body flown wherever you prefer. Is there anything else we can do? Just make sure that guy fries for what he's done. Ted's eyes flashed with a deep and terrifying anger. He stood quickly, wiping his eyes, and stormed out of the room. The pale blue water on the Zero Edge Hotel pool at Pigeon Island Beach on the north side of St. Lucia shimmered in the glorious sunlight. Ted stretched out on a chaise lounge, reached over to take the hand of a long-legged, tanned, blonde woman relaxing next to him. Having a good time, honey? His bright smile from a cleanly shaved face belied the anguish of the past few days. Absolutely, the woman said. A cell phone sitting on a small table rang with a digital flute tone. Ted picked it up, pressed the answer button and said, Hello? Ah, Mr. Anderson, Detective Artista said brightly. I see you are still enjoying our beautiful island. Well, my flight wasn't scheduled to leave for a few more days, so that is good news, my friend, because we have some unfinished business. And what would that be? You've got your killer. Do we? Mr. Ted Anderson, you are under arrest for the murder of your wife. My associate should be there to accompany you back to police headquarters. Four police officers close in around Ted's chair, one with a weapon drawn. What? Wait. Now I believe we have our killer and the one who hired the taxi driver to pick up your wife and dispose of her. See you at the police station, Mr. Anderson. The end.
Be back with us next time on Murder in the Air Mystery Theater, episode 29, when we'll have Alex Kenna here. She's a painter, a criminal attorney, and the author of her first novel that is a writer's bone best of 2022 pick. And on episode number 30, hear a segment from Betty Webb's latest Lost in Paris and the research involved in this period piece set in 1922 France. If you're listening on the podcast platform of your choice, please subscribe and leave a review or provide us with feedback. If you're on YouTube at Read Lori Fagan, please subscribe, give us a thumbs up, and click on the bell to be notified when a new episode has been released. And for some freebies, check out our Patreon page at Murder in the Air Mystery Theater. For more information, you can visit ReadLaurieFagan.com. Thanks so much for listening, and come back again where you'll always find murder in the air. Murder in the air.